give you guys a little bit of a background on how I came to buy this Bobcat and the events that led to me purchasing the Bobcat and the condition that it was in. So I purchased the Bobcat online, sight unseen through an auction, um, tip with any typical option. There's a bunch of pictures that are taken. Um, with this particular auction, there's an inspector that goes out to the machine. They go through the normal functions of the machine. Um, they identify what works, what doesn't work. And they go through it and they'll identify you know, any issues with the machine non-running. Uh, then they go and attempt to start the machine and run the machine through the normal functions and identify if there's anything uh, mechanically wrong with the vehicle or the machine when it's, when it's running. So in this particular case, the Bobcat was sold under parts, listed as a parts only machine um, or under inoperable condition. Um, and we'll see why some of that stuff comes to play, but ultimately when I saw the machine, uh, one of the tracks was off, there was damage or issues with the, the drive sprocket and the idler on the operator's right side, uh, and then when in the interior of the cab, Bobcat does a good job of uh, identifying service codes if there's anything wrong with the machine. In this case, there was a code. Uh, We'll go over more later on in the video, but the code showed that the fuel water separator was full. So uh, I kind of took a gamble on this and identified that, you know, very worst case scenario, if I had to put a whole new engine in it, uh, as long as I got the machine for the right price, then I could potentially re replace the engine uh, and have a functioning running machine, which again is a gamble. Uh, however, I was somewhat confident that most of the issues were going to be in the fuel system. So I figured if I could go through the fuel system, uh, most likely I'd be able to get the thing running at least uh, and, and diagnose, you know, is it major problems, go through the, the process and see where we're at, where we're standing with the machine, but hopefully have a machine that didn't have to spend a whole lot of money for, got under market value, and be able to use for some of the stuff that I have planned for it. So I made the five hour trip to one way to go get the machine get it loaded up on the trailer, since we obviously weren't going to be able to drive it onto the trailer. Luckily, the yard that the machine was located at, they had plenty of equipment. In the event that this wheel loader was not able to load the machine, they had cranes and uh, larger forklifts. And one way or another, the machine was going to go on the trailer. So, Let's see if we can then get it off of the trailer, which was the harder portion of what we went through during this video. And that's really the goal of what we covered in this video is we needed to get it off of the trailer. Uh, the trailer needed to be used for other things and it's, it's not my trailer. So getting the machine off of the trailer was pretty important. So the two things that needed to happen is one, we needed to get the operator's right side drive sprocket and rear idle layer replaced so that we can get the other track on the machine. And then the other major task that we had to do was get the Bobcat running, um, whether it was gonna be a quick fix just to get it off of the trailer or potentially solve some of the major issues. Uh, but those were the two things that I needed to get done in this video. One, get the Bobcat so that it actually could move if it was running and then get the Bobcat running. So this was actually pretty interesting to me. On the operator's left side, earlier in the video, it shows there's a little bit of wear beginning, but ultimately the rear idler is somewhat round. And then on this side of the machine, you can see it actually looks like a gear, but it's not supposed to be that shape at all. It's supposed to be round. So over time, the metal linkage between the tracks rotating over the drive sprocket has worn down this particular rear idler. So as you can see, some of the problems that that would cause if we tried to put the track on it. Um, to get it off and actually the track that does need to go on here has a pretty significant uh, rip where one of the the drive links have come off uh, is only holding on to the river by one part so that track needs to be ultimately replaced in the future
full disclaimer, I am not the heavy equipment mechanic. I am not a mechanic. I'm not claiming to be a mechanic or a heavy equipment mechanic. I'm just somewhat mechanically inclined, but I get things wrong all the time, and I just have trial and error. And that's how I learn or get better with stuff. But as you can see, I'm fighting to get this rear idler in, and ultimately what's keeping it from going in is that block of wood that's behind it. For whatever reason, I can't see that as of right now in this part of the video, but a little bit later on, I catch on to what's actually going on and get that out of there, and finally, it slides right into place. But, uh, again, not a mechanic, just trying to make some stuff work for me and show you guys what, what the process looks like for me. And uh, If you have any recommendations or things that I can improve or you know, what keep me from having run into some of these headaches, feel free to comment down below.
get that track on the right side of the machine. Uh, no major issues with getting that drive sprocket and that idler swapped out. It was actually pretty simple. Uh, and then getting the track on with the track gear was the way to go because that thing weighs quite a bit. And muscle not around by hand would have been possible, but would not have been fun. So uh, glad to have the tractor there. That made quick work of getting that track on. So now we can move on to the second part of getting this bobcat off the trailer, which is getting it running. So this is turn on the machine, what I, what I see. So it's got battery power, uh, the vitals come up, and then on the left-hand side, it shows the code. So this code shows that the fuel water separator is full, uh, but also, as you note, there's not much fuel in the machine. So first start by putting some fuel in the machine and then trying to diagnose why the fuel water separators is full by either draining it, uh, but ultimately I end up replacing the filter altogether. Uh, I figured that was the safer and smarter way to go, uh, but you'll see here there's some weird things going on. So there's an inline filter that was added that is not does not come with the machine. Somebody added this. As you can see, it's full of water. And, uh, quite a bit of separation between the diesel and the water. And then later on, there's another aftermarket component on this fuel system that doesn't quite make sense uh, to me yet, but it may in the future. So if you have any comments or know why it was done this way, you can feel free to leave a comment down below. So sure enough, the machine was right. There was quite a bit of water in the fuel filter. As you can see here, it pours out. Uh, and then once I got this removed, I had access to an inline fuel pump that was added to the machine. So it's an Edelbrock diesel inline fuel pump. Uh, normally these have a bulb that you squeeze and you prime the fuel system with, but for whatever reason, this got installed. So I don't know why that's on there right now. But I assume the previous owner was having fuel issues and maybe some injector issues and uh, that might have been a temporary fix for the previous owner. Now with the fuel filter off and unplugged, I wanted to see if the codes changed. Uh, and it did, I got a different code. So the 4522 code is basically saying that the fuel sensor is out of range or ultimately saying it's unplugged. And then that second code, the 0909 code was just low fuel. So I got the new fuel filter installed. It's a pretty simple swap. I had to reroute some of the lines because of that inline filter and make some stuff work for me. So it's not fitting in there the way it's supposed to right now. Uh, but again, I just need to get this machine off the trailer. So uh, temporarily, that's the position it's in. Uh, and then over checking the machine to see if the codes still remain. Uh, no longer get the fuel codes uh, or any codes at all. So you can attempt at starting it. So the M0309 code is just saying that the low battery or doesn't have enough uh, cranking amps to turn the machine over. So uh, I do attempt to set it up and, and get a jump start on it to see if that makes any changes. Uh, but hopefully what I run into is, is the same. And it doesn't sound like it's it doesn't have enough power. It sounds like it has plenty of power and the starter's turning over. It could turn over a little bit faster, uh, but ultimately I think it has enough to actually start the machine should it be receiving the proper fuel. However, the one thing I'm trying to avoid in this process is using starting fluid. Uh, I didn't want to compromise the machine and, and cause any further issues or cause any damage should there be damage. Uh, again, I don't know what condition the machine is in when, when it was running or when it last ran. Uh, there was a 
few cans of starting fluid in the machine, uh, which isn't the end of the world, but if somebody that's not being responsible with it or uh, spraying too much in there, it could easily damage the machine. So I'm trying to avoid this at all costs, but uh, ultimately I kind of get desperate and kind of unfortunately have to go that route. So I'm trying to use as little as possible, but uh, I do end up having to clean out the air box, which is completely filthy. Uh, I do give it a squirt of sparting fluid to see if that's going to make a difference. stoked that the shop vac went for a ride off the trailer here. But ultimately, it didn't knock, it didn't start off rough and then clean out or anything. And there wasn't any crazy major noises when the machine started up, so I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Uh, ultimately, I didn't end up using too much target fluid at all. and gave it just a very small spray, and then, it, like I said, it fired right up. And, uh, this is what it sounded like. track back on the machine and the machine not running we were able to get it off the trailer and accomplish the goal that we set out for so uh, overall I'm pretty stoked I've got a running operating machine that I can now go through and try to see what if there's any more problems or give it a good full tune-up and go through all the systems and make sure everything's running the way it's supposed to but uh, this has definitely surpassed my expectations and being able to drive this machine off of the trailer at the end of the video is uh, was pretty Pretty cool so uh, appreciate you watching if you want to see some more content of me trying to fix this thing up and getting it operating the way it's supposed to go ahead and like the video and let me know in the comments appreciate it.